Have you heard about hormone disrupting chemicals in the environment, but wondered, uh, are they really affecting me? Is it really that big of a deal? And how about the impact of these toxins on your sex life? Hey! <laughs> Welcome to The Healthy View. Today, we are going to be talking about just that. My name is Michelle Fenikaus, and I'm here with Andrea Beeman and Lisa Lutan. As always, we are expert health coaches who've collectively helped tens of thousands of women around the world to get happier, get healthier, while staying sane and having fun. And today, we also have with us functional medicine doctor, Lindsay Berkson, whose newest book is titled Sexy Brain. Lisa, can you tell us a little bit more about Dr. Berkson? Absolutely. Dr. Lindsay Berkson is a rock star in functional medicine. For decades, she's been focusing on nutrition, hormones, intimacy, and digestion. She's considered one of the early thought leaders and pioneers of natural medicine, teaching and training doctors and pharmacists in the science behind natural answers. Dr. Berkson wrote, one of the first gut mind nutrition books called Healthy Digestion the Natural Way, which was used to train physicians. One of the first books on hormone altering chemicals called Hormone Deception. And her newest book, Sexy Brain, tells us how to protect our intimacy and brain. Dr. Bergson is also a hormone scholar at a think tank, a clinician, a research fellow, and a breast cancer survivor for 25 years. And we are so, so excited to have you on the show. Welcome, Dr. Lindsay. I am so excited to be on a show with really dynamite ladies that really focus on turning health around the world for women around the world. Yay for you. Woohoo! Woo yay for you too. Well, this is super fun. And before we jump into a ton of questions that we all have about hormones, we just want to know, what did you have for breakfast today? <laughs> well, what I had for breakfast today, I don't, I don't start my day with breakfast. There's a lot of data now to show that if you don't eat until after you exercise, that you burn more calories. And what are we always trying to do? Get more of a scarlet O'Hara waste. And it's much <laughs> more difficult to lose weight. And we're going to talk about hormone altering chemicals role in this. It is definitively scientifically proven. It's harder to lose weight in 2019 than it was in 1980. Part of that is because of the polluted planet that we live in. So you always have to do a bunch of strategies throughout your day to up your ante of keeping yourself svelte, lean, and mean. So I don't eat until after I work out. And usually I start my day with a bowl of pomegranate arils, A-I-R-L-S, arils. Those are the little red seeds. They're, they're little red fleshy fruit over a white seed. And they're the most potent antioxidant of any food known. And the seed is the only food that has omega-5 fatty acid that completely protects against cancer, protects your kidney, your brain, your heart. It's one of the most protective foods you could have. It's quite extraordinary, the data on it. So I start my day with that. And it also signals your insulin receptor and it helps you keep your appetite and your weight down. See, this is why I love this question so much. I learned so much by the way people answer. But you just have these pomegranate arils, what you said. Is that it? The whole breakfast? Nothing else with it? <laughs> well, so I'm not a big fan of eating um, earlier in the day. So I'll usually have that. And then if I feel like having some ground flaxseed or one of my flaxseed muffins, which is a lot of people love my seed muffin, flourless, sugar-free, gluten-free you know, yada, yada. <laughs> it's now on a food of everything it's not. <laughs> it's bigger than what the food is. <laughs> so um, I usually keep it pretty light, but if I were to eat, I might have some vegetables or I might have a little bit of a smoothie or my seed muffin. But honestly, I usually start with just a plain bowl of pomegranate arils and they've kind of changed my life. I have a question. I, yeah. Are you getting the ones that are pre-made for you? You know, that's what you, I'm wondering. <laughs> or are you breaking them open every morning and knocking them out yourself? Oh, what a cute little question! And I love <laughs> you know the the graphic, the, the GIF that went with it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta knock them. You gotta literally. My brain is really working because I'm eating pomegranate arils. Um, <laughs> You can't get them in season all the time. They're not in season all the time, so you can get them at at 
um, Costco, you can get them at Whole Foods, you can get them at Target, you can get them all over the place. Now Walmart has them and they come in a little teeny plastic container and in my freezer, I'll have the freezer com completely filled with frozen containers of pomegranate arils and then I just take one out for every two days and it's really been a game changer. Um, even though I eat so well, uh, I have a problem with one of my genes called um, APOC3 gene, which is the gene that allows your good cholesterol to act good. Mm -hmm. And that gene, when it's, it's tweaked, makes your good cholesterol be stupid and act bad, even though it was supposed to act good. And pomegranate arils turn back on that gene and make your good cholesterol work a little bit better, one of its many huge job descriptions. And it's quite extraordinary for people that want to protect their heart um, and want to protect their kidney. It's really, and, and if you want to figure out how to have a better time eating less amounts of food, because in America, we've trained ourselves to eat such large portions that when we want to go smaller, it's a little hard. Pomegranates activate your insulin receptor in a way that make you feel content with less food. So they're a real trick in your tool bag with helping you keep your weight down. Right. I need this trick. So, <laughs> so do you eat them at the beginning of the meal and then you don't want to eat as much? No, I don't think it's like that. I just uh -huh. enjoy them during the day and they're so regular in my diet that I've really noticed now in sharing it with patients that it does have, and nothing works the same exact way in everybody. And there are other tricks, by the way, to help people's appetite go down. There's lots of tricks these days, but this does seem, so far I've, I've probably recommended it to about 25 patients and the majority of them say that they are experiencing much more contentment with a smaller amount of food but you have to eat them regularly and you have to eat at least a quarter of a cup a day game on really okay you want to chew the little white seed inside till it's like a little pulp and swallow that because that's where you're very it's the only food on the planet that has omega-5 fatty acid protects against breast cancer like nobody's business that omega-5 fatty acid, and it's the only food that contains it of all the plant kingdom. And it's in the center of that little red flesh, that white seed. So you got to chew that up really well and swallow. I'm so excited. I love pomegranates. So I'm We're going to talk about this. I know. Well, <laughs> like, I suppose we should get to hormones, even though I could talk about this all day. But let's start at the really basic level. What are hormones and how do they function in our bodies? Great question, because even doctors are not taught what hormones are. If you think of your body as a computer, hormones are your physiologic internet system. And they send emails to all of your cells, not just your breasts and your ovaries or your testicles, but everywhere. Hormones send emails to your brain, to your kidneys, to the lining of your digestive tract, to your liver, to your gallbladder. And these emails signal your genes to be turned on or off so that your cells will take care of you. So hormones are in essence, your internet system, sending emails to tissues to keep them healthy. Hormones rule. They're not just about sexy and reproductive things. They literally rule everything. And that's not really taught like that in med school. You know, gynecologists kind of focus on the hormones of the menstrual cycle and urologists. I've dated a few urologists and they don't, they're not trained <laughs> the hormones in the way that of this kind of global job description. And when I was a scholar at the estrogen and think tank at Tulane, I worked with the scientists that discovered the first and the second estrogen receptor and all the guys that have been looking at what hormones do on the planet and how they really function. And hormones are really the main way, along with neurotransmitters, the main signaling molecules that keep you the best version of you. Okay, so if hormones are emails through your body, where's the email server? Like, where is it all coming from? Okay, well, hormones come either, um, they're either made from different glands throughout your body. That's called endocrinology. They're made somewhere in your body, squirted out like you'd squirt a toothpaste out, travel through your um, bloodstream, and lying 
uh, surrounding all of your tissues, you have satellite dishes, which are proteins in the shape of a satellite dish in wait for those hormone emails or signals. You know, they're kind of just moving around like this waiting for those signals and you've got them all over your body and they deliver. So they're made in one place, swim through your bloodstream and deliver it. But that's one form, that's endocrinology. Then there's intracrinology which is the local production of hormones. You have hormones made in your brain. You have estrogen, progesterone made right inside your brain. You have in your heart because hormones run your heart. You have hormones literally produced right inside the valves of your heart. You have hormones made right inside your kidney because estrogen protects the kidney. You have hormones made inside little organelles um, in cells because hormones protect your mitochondria, your energy furnaces against damage. So they're made locally, then they're utilized, and then they're broken down. And in the lab, we know this to be true, but we don't have a way yet clinically in a doctor's office to test for the intracologic production of hormones, which is why just running your blood saliva or urine levels isn't accurate because it's not the whole hormonal picture. And hormones aren't just about your level, which most doctors just go by your level. It's whether it can swim into that satellite dish and send the email to your gene. So receptor functionality, satellite functionality is where the rubber meets the road of hormones. You can have great levels of testosterone in a man, but if you're receptor is funky, you will have more feminizing traits or feel more anxious or have a tendency to hold on to weight or you know, not be able to close that deal in your job because your testosterone looks good to your doctor testing it, but it, it can't get into that receptor. And that's where the dirty planet is somewhat coming into play because your, your satellite dish can be clogged with many of the pollutants that are in, we are exposed to 24 seven in everyday life. So I have a million questions about testosterone, but I'm going to hold off because I think we'll never get past that question. <laughs> well, seminar on testosterone. <laughs> right, exactly. But I, so are, are there 20 different hormones or 200 different hormones in our body? Like how many different types are there? Oh, there's probably at least 200 and they're counting. And there's, and for, for example, with estrogen, we think of estrogen as three main estrogens estradiol, estrone, estriol, like they're the stars of the show. You know, they're, they're, they're Lady Gaga estrogens, Lady Gaga. <laughs> but you really have about 60 different estrogenic chemicals that can signal into that receptor. So you actually have multiple and you have estrogen is broken down into breakdown products. So you make a hormone you break it all down, you use it, you break it down, you get rid of it. Make it, get rid of it, make it, get rid of it. The middle men are all these broken down pieces and they all have different actions and they can all have estrogenic actions in one form or another. So it's when you read most things on the internet or even in med school books, it's very simplistic versus the reality of what hormones do inside the body. It's a much bigger picture than for some reason medicine has has taught to its providers, but when at the think tank with all the world leaders of hormones, hormones really rule how we occupy our body suit and how we perceive our world and how our moods are. So the idea that we have um, so many hormone altering chemicals in our air, food, water, plastics, personal care products, uh, water treatment systems, because they don't get rid of the birth control pills and a lot of the hormones that we dump into the toilet or into the um, waste sites. We're recycling a lot of chemicals that fill these receptors and won't let healthy hormones deliver their signal. For example, we think there's an obesity epidemic that doesn't make sense just based on eating too much and binging on Doritos in front of the TV, people are exercising more than ever. So Bruce Blumberg, who's a scientist from UC, um, University of California at Irvine, I interviewed him for Hormone Deception. I just chatted with him the other day. He has shown that these chemicals, for example, like nonstick cookware, when you cook in nonstick cookware, when you buy a mattress that has flame retardant on it, these chemicals go into your body 
and they go into the receptor that has a lot to do with your fat cell production and they make your fat cells nasty. They don't respond to fasting. They don't respond to exercise. They just won't let go and they get bigger and bigger. So he's called these um, chemicals that make your fat cells nasty obesogens and your fat cells obesogenic. And he was able to show if he took rodents in the lab and exposed them to an endocrine disrupting compound. So one of the ones he's been working with is called tributylene. It's painted on the bottom of ships to make sure barnacles and stuff doesn't grow there. And it's all in the water. So it's all in the fish that we eat, trying to eat more fish. So tributylene, he'll expose a pregnant rodent to it. And then he'll watch the next four generations. They just get fatter and fatter and fatter. In the fourth generation, if he makes them not eat for four days, the ones that he compares them to, the control animals, they'll just shrink like crazy not eating for four days. They won't lose any weight. So one of the biggest problems in healthcare these days is resistant weight. And a lot of it is coming from our hormones no longer working well because of hormone altering chemicals, because of this whole idea that a hormone delivers a signal to this receptor and it can get clogged. So I've been working really hard to try and help people do receptor detoxes and so forth, but it's, it's a big important issue. Um, what, since we're run by hormones and we live in a dirty planet with dirty food that's disrupting our hormones, what does this say for the future of the human race? It's kind of downright terrifying the way you look at it. I think we all have to just eat pomegranates and, you know, <laughs> pray for the best here. <laughs> no, but kidding aside, um, there's so much talk about, especially for women, about needing hormone replacement. And I'm wondering, you know, what are your feelings on that? How do we know if we need hormone replacement? And what, what is the difference between synthetic hormones and bioidentical hormones? I know there's a lot in there. But that was, they're all really good questions, though. You did a really good job, you know, stacking those. I like Thank that. you. <laughs> You've got about 100 more. So, so um, first of all, because we have hormone-altering chemicals, we are seeing hormone insufficiencies at younger and younger ages. So it used to be when you talk about do women need hormone replacement, you're talking about perimenopausal women, postmenopausal women, and menopausal men, or andropausal men is, you know, the more accurate name. The truth is that we now have a replicated, published out of New England, you know, close to where you got your, it came out of Boston, in fact, um, replicated data that there's a testosterone deficiency epidemic in younger and younger males that's age independent, that has nothing to do with being younger uh, or older. What it is, is we're thinking is more obesity and more hormone altering chemicals. So we're going to see hormone replacement needed in younger people, not necessarily just at those milestones of reproductive life or you're perimenopausal or postmenopausal. So we have to kind of stretch ourselves and understand that hormone replacement now isn't just for older people. So that's the first thing. So we are sometimes now use, and we use hormones sometimes therapeutically because they do so many things. So hormones aren't just for peri and postmenopause, but now we'll go to that. So since hormones run so many things in your body, really a big part of what aging or senescence is, is the loss of your hormone signals. Your computer is freezing up. You're getting no email. <laughs> Open it up. You go, I ain't got no email. And Sounds I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It really is true that, um, so one of the most profound studies ever was the Cache County studies out of Utah, where they took about 7,000 people that were totally well and healthy in their 50s, and they followed them in the future. So it was a prospective study, which gives you pretty strong data when they data drudge information from those studies. And they found, because everyone used to be worried about the big C of cancer, now we're worried about the big C of cognitive decline. And they found that if women had been on estrogen for 10 years, that she had up to a 50% decreased incidence of Alzheimer's disease. 
and there's nothing else that's ever been shown. And Dr. Bresden, who's a, sci a neuroscientist at um, University of California in Los Angeles, he has a protocol now, he's a book out and everything, he's been publishing in aging journals, that he can slow down or reverse dementia in quite, in mild and moderate cases. And he uses a big laundry list of things, but at the top of the list are hormones. Because hormones turn your brain on. That's why my book is called Sexy Brain, because sex steroid hormones signal your brain. So if aging... Wait, is that in men and women? Because I feel that only women, the brain is signaled. <laughs> this head is signaled. But in men, it may be the other head that's signaled. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> Can I plagiarize that? <laughs> so if, you know, we think of aging as inevitably, now there's gravity's God power, man. Gravity is a force to be reckoned with. But we think of aging is inevitably getting weaker and meeker and less motivation and stupider and slower. And most people start speaking slower and all kinds of things like that. When you get your hormones tested and replaced and it has to be done individually and tracked individually. And, you know, it's a totally different story from woman to woman. If you've got a uterus, you have to have your, you have to have a vaginal ultrasound and make sure the lining of your uterus doesn't grow out of control. There's all kinds of ways to make sure you can take hormones safely you don't have that same inevitable aging because your email is still delivering signals to your cells and you slow aging down. It's as close to an anti-aging tool that we have. So what is the difference between synthetic hormones and bioidentical hormones? It's huge. So synthetic hormones are a patentable product when you can patent something, it most of the time means that it's, it's a brand new molecule that nature's never seen, so you can get a patent on it. Then you can go through the cabillion dollar process of getting it into a drug, and then you can sell it for profit. So you made these hormones that the human body had never seen before, and you needed these huge randomized controlled trials because you don't know how people's bodies are going to respond to it but our bodies are set up to respond to our own exact hormones. So a bioidentical hormone is exactly the molecular structure that nature gave you of estrogen, of progesterone, of testosterone, of aldosterone, of oxytocin, the love hormone. You know, these are the hormones, the way that your body made. So for, so NAMS, the North American Menopause Society is kind of the guru society downloading Vulcan mind melding information to gynecologists world, you know, US over about what hormones are and are not. And they're down on bioidentical hormones, which are coming. It's, it's coming that we're all going to be up on it. But the, the, the real um, flashing red light is that women had been given hormone replacement to mm. beat aging for like 50 years. It was the number one selling product in the pharmaceutical industry for many, many decades. And finally, in the la latter part, um, or the early part of 2000, uh, they took a look at some data where they made the first uh, randomized trials to say, well, does, does hormones really do all the great things we said to women it did? And we're sure it's going to do that, but let's, let's have a randomized trial now to show that it does it. And it didn't. In the early trials, it looked like it caused breast cancer and mm. stroke yeah. and heart attack. So everybody threw hormones out the window. Those hormones that were used in that study were Premarin from horse urine and medroxyprogesterone acetate, MP, uh, so MPA. So we had synthetic hormones. In the arm where women had horse's urine plus a synthetic progestin, so now progestin, that made big headlines. Women got totally scared that hormones would give them breast cancer. In the estrogen-only arm at reanalyses by st statisticians at Yale and places all over the country, the estrogen-only arm had 33% less breast cancer. Estrogen protects against breast cancer. And if it's in excessive signaling, if you get more than you need, that's a different story. But in the olden days, they gave large dosages of estrogen, six to nine milligrams a day to treat breast cancer. So there's so much misunderstanding. Well, anyway, in the reanalysis of all of this women's health initiative that made everybody scared to death of getting breast cancer from hormones, 
no one got the headline news that the estrogen only arm protected women against breast cancer. And, but synthetic hormones are getting a bad rap more and more and more because bioidentical hormones have less issues and there's no studies to show that they have any, you know, cause more issues, cause more problems. So the CEOs of the companies that originally made PremPro and Premarin formed a brand new company and created a bioidentical patentable product called Replenish. They're almost through stage three trials, and now they're publishing all over the place the same guys that badmouthed, loudly badmouthed bioidentical hormones are now saying they're more effective, they're safer, they're the only way to go. Of course, they're giving them orally, which we don't recommend because there's a lot of changes when you swallow something and process it through your mm -hmm. digestive tract. So bioidentical is the way mother nature made it. And we have better idea how your body will handle it, even though it still needs to be individualized, the dosing and how you take it and how your body is tracked in the beginning to make sure it's doing well and safe with it. The synthetic are altered and you don't totally know how the body's going to deal with it. And we do know that the synthetic progestin creates a lot of problems and certainly makes any pre-existing cancers start to grow faster and faster. So if By people way, are... oral contraceptives, birth uh -huh. control pills are progestins. Mm -hmm. So if people aren't taking these hormones orally, are they taking them through creams? Like how are they typically being applied or ingested? So, so that's called, great question. That's called delivery mode. Delivery Our, mode. What is the delivery mode? Right. That's exactly right. That's the term for it. Okay. You can, you can take it orally, which we don't recommend for estrogen, but for progesterone at certain times we do. You can take it topically. There's tremendous body of literature on topical absorption, but not all women's skin absorbs hormones in the same way. And some women who handle topical hormones really well for a few years end up getting what we call dermal fatigue, and then their skin just doesn't handle it well. So there's, but that is the most common route. And there's a lot of data to show that it's a safe route. It doesn't cause heart disease. It decreases the risk of heart disease, but not all women can, can absorb from their skin. I can't. My skin is very, very thin. I don't have very much fat. You know, it's usually it gets absorbed in your fat and kind of under the skin and time releases it out. If you don't have a lot of fat, that's kind of a hard way for you to go at it. You can also do it uh, mucosally and you can take a trochee inside your cheek and let it be absorbed through the mucosa of your cheek. You could take it in the, inside your labia or in the vaginal vault and let it be absorbed. And there's a lot that we can discuss about the data out there about safety, comparing the different delivery modes. I'm a big fan of vaginal because there's um, in very large body of research out of Finland, women who take their hormones vaginally do not have any increased risk of clots or cancers or breast cancers. It's the safest route. And I had breast cancer 25 years ago, most, the, the, the consensus at the present is if you've had breast cancer, you should never be on hormones. Well, I don't think that that's accurate at all, but you have to be very careful. I have a new ebook coming out very soon uh, written for women to hand to their cancer docs about the science of how they can take hormones to sail through the post-treatment better and reduce their risk of recurrence. Wow. I do want to touch on testosterone, which we came to earlier. So many of the women. Just touch testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many women that in my groups, they're always curious about testosterone, um, you know, in terms of increasing their sex drive. And I'm curious, you know, I've heard so many mixed reviews on this, on side effects, on what it can do. We hear a lot about testosterone for men, but I really want to hear your thoughts on testosterone for women. Well, I have a book out called Safe Hormone Smart Women, and it summarizes all of this. And in Sexy Brain, I have a whole chapter on testosterone and why is it so controversial? What you're saying is exactly right. It's controversial on roids. There's so many... Hormone medicine is the most misunderstood genre of medicine there is. It's shocking. And when I was at um, the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, which was at Tulane, 
they would get so frustrated about how the academic body of information is translated into the clinical trenches, which is why I love doing talks like this, because once you can hear a lot of things, you can make a little bit better decisions or maybe not be so confused about things. But testos testosterone is in both men and women. Um, it does so many things. Estrogen has about 800 job descriptions and it keeps growing. Testosterone has at least four or 500. One of the biggest ones is that testosterone protects your breast against breast cancer. Tes maleness protects femaleness. Crazy. And um, mm -hmm. I could go into, I go, well, I can't do that on the show now. It's so delicious how <laughs> male and female hormones since 400,000 years ago have been helping each other out. And I, that's all Michael Baker's research. And I kind of summarize it in, a, in an entertaining way in the book, but maleness does protect femaleness. So cancer is growth out of control. You don't want your breast cells to have growth out of control. And at the breast, testosterone controls growth. So it keeps your breast cells from growing out of control. And testosterone also, there's one estrogen that when it's signaled, it's an anti-cancer estrogen. For some reason, a lot of people don't know about it. It's not taught that much or talked about in med school. Um, it's called estriol. It's a pregnancy estrogen. It elevates a hugely about 400% when you're pregnant, but estriol will shut up a cancer cell and testosterone signals that estrogen. So testosterone is very cancer protective in women's breasts. And it's also cancer protective at the prostate prior to the situation of when, if you get prostate cancer. And that side of testosterone being protective isn't well understood. We know it in autoimmune diseases. There's 159 known autoimmune diseases and all but one, the kidney, um, they all happen more to women because women have less testosterone. And testosterone helps your gut wall immune system work. So it's got all these, it's like the gladiator hormone that protects you on all these levels. And we think of it mainly as the libido hormone, which it also does, but it's not the only job description, yet this isn't taught that much in school. So when you think of hormone replacement, doctors will say, well, you don't really need testosterone or you'll grow hair. Or if you don't want a libido, if you're single, you forget it, you don't need it. But they don't understand all these other things that testosterone does. It also protects your brain against Alzheimer's disease. So for women that are looking to use testosterone to increase their sex drive, is that the way to go? Or is it one of these estrogens or progesterone? No, testosterone is definitely the way to increase your sex drive. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but you at least try it out. Um, some women, you give them testosterone replacement based on what their own blood and their own symptoms uh, reflect they need. And some women get tremendously improved Levito, so much so that if you don't treat their husband, you're going to cause problems in their marriage. <laughs> and some women don't respond to it that way. It's, it's a little bit of a hit or miss, but more often than not, testosterone does boost libido. But there's other hormones that boost libido too, like the love hormone oxytocin boosts libido. And nutrients help hormones work. So some nutrients also boost libido. So hormones, um, these little satellite dishes are like bowls filled with nutrients and your food choices and digestion uh, are what determine how flush this bowl is of nutrients. And if the hormone comes in, you need all these nutrients for the hormone to work. So, you know, it's funny that people just run your hormone level because hormones are this bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And yet, to work with people's hormones in the clinic, you don't look at the parts of these bigger pictures. So it's like the five blind men touching the elephant, you know, and saying, it's a tusk, it's a tail. So hormones are this big elephant, this big picture. And I love to pass it on. I had a hormone coach that was coaching tons of ladies, but she um, wasn't feeling good. And you especially need zinc. Zinc kind of pulls the hormone 
into the binding domain, it's called a zinc finger, two atoms of zinc pull it in. We ran her red blood cell level of zinc because she was on hormones. She was doing everything right, but she wasn't getting the right response. Put her on, she was low, uh, gave her some zinc and that was it. She started feeling much, much better. So it's this bigger picture. You know, most gynecologists at this moment aren't testing red blood cell levels of zinc, right? Is, have you had that happen to you? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and I was wondering, since we're talking about libido and increasing libido, could you talk about the connection between chemicals in our environment, like you mentioned the mattress or you know, other uh, disruptors, and how that impacts our sex life? Thank you. Thank you for bringing around to that. Blessings. Um, <laughs> I really, so it, I, I wrote Sexy Brain. I, I was driven to write Sexy Brain. I didn't really want to write Sexy Brain, but it showed up on my lap and I had to put this out in a book. It took three years to compile it all together. And what I realized is happening is environmental castration is happening. Hmm. So all these hormone altering chemicals are getting into the egg and the sperm and the placenta and mother's milk. It's happening there. It's not just our daily exposure. So I'm a big fan of the future, having green pregnancies, maybe insurance reimbursed before you even conceive. But um, these are altering. So exposure before conception, the egg and the sperm are filled with fat. And all these chemicals love fat. They're lipophilic. So egg and sperm, if you eat non-organic food and have a plastic full life and live in a home with lots of outgassing and on the road a lot, your egg and sperm are filled with a lot of hormone altering chemicals. And those are affecting our desire to connect with each other, to have sex, our gender identification. At Tulane, at the conferences, which we called E.Hormone the last few years, we were all be saying, are we gonna be seeing a lot of gender bending? Is there gonna be a lot of difference in the way we look at each other as genders, the way we desire each other? Because our hormones are being altered. Uh, they, there's now, in pregnancy alone, there's about 40% of pregnancies have complications in the United States, which heralds health issues in the mom and the child as they grow up. Just 20 years ago, it was only 3%. Now it's 40%. And we're seeing changes where people and it's not just hormones because there's cultural changes and there's texting is the new talking and there's Tinder where you can have a candy box filled of potential partners, a thousand of them, they never end, just swipe left, swipe right, swipe. So, you know, there's all these cultural um, cues converging at the same time where people aren't feeling the desire to connect the same libido. People are having libido problems earlier and earlier. Young men are having erectile dysfunction in their 20s starting to appear like men used to have in their 70s and 80s. It's happening now a lot more. Now part of it's obesity and bad food. It's not just hormone altering chemicals, but we're in a brand new scenario that humanity has never seen before. And the term that I put out there is environmental castration. And then I talk in the book what we can do about it and some answers to reduce our exposure and to get our libido back because your drive to hug, to connect, to honor another human being, to co connection is the true vitamin C. And that drive drives humanity. And right now that drive is being distorted and is chaotic. And, and um, it's, our hormones are at risk, which is why I love an opportunity to help people understand that your hormones should be watching your back and you want to tend them and perhaps even take them um, to help you have a healthier future. You know, it's interesting when you were talking about the percentage of people that are having trouble with pregnancy now, you know, 40% 40, 40 as opposed to 3%. The one thought that popped up for me is that we're just creating an environment that can't sustain the human population. So it's almost like we're naturally culling our population. This was the huge topic at the conferences at Tulane, is the earth in a downward spir spiral and out of control. And a lot of times, so most of the people that came to these conferences were heads of environmental health sciences at different universities, like the University of Minnesota, or University of Chicago, and they'd be coming and sharing all of their research and data about what the dirty planet is doing on all these different levels. And then at night, people would get just drunk out of control at the last few years of these conferences because they felt so 
um, doomsday. Mm. So with the last conference we had, they focused on remediation and they said only apply to give a poster or a talk if you have an answer. Mm. And there were so many answers to clean things up, to clean up lakes, to clean up air. But our present political situation with the guy that we've got in the White House signing bills with Monsanto over his shoulder, you know, smooching together, that's not going to help us because the EPA has been eviscerated. You know, it's just been harmed so greatly. But I do believe that there is hope. But this is true. Unless we do take action, which is why it's great to have talks like this, this does look like a huge black cloud over humanity. In fact, um, there was Harvard got together with Huffington Post and they put out a forum which people could go just put in Harvard Huffington Post hormone altering chemical forum. It was January 31st, 2017. And a lot of the guys I worked with at Tulane were there on, on the panel. And they said there's three major threats to humanity. The first is nuclear war. No one can contest that. The second is global warming. And depending on who you vote for, you can contest that. And the third is hormone altering chemicals because they are threatening our ability to want to conceive, to have pregnancies that are helpful, to have fertility, to have brains that work. Um, they rule us, which is a new understanding of hormones, not yet in the brain of your doctor that you go to to ask whether you should be on hormones. Don't ask them because they don't have this bigger picture at mm. the moment, even though they're well-intentioned and wonderful and they're to help you. Um, and so that's why you do need to start le living a green life and pass the good word forward. Thanks. For all of humanity. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> take a drink. I yeah. mean, can we get just a couple solutions on the table? I mean, already I'm like, whew. Just party and have sex. Just <laughs> and that's what you should do. It's the answer to it all because if you can, if you can perform. <laughs> <laughs> so party and have sex. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, so apparently us cougars, we can't even have the young fellas anymore because they can't even... They have, that's right, dysfunction. Young fellows are just not, you know, the <laughs> thing now is for young guys to want to be with a mature sexual garrette to <laughs> help them out. But the, a lot of the young guys are having a lot of issues in their tissues. Um, and <laughs> wow. If, but, you know, this is the drive. It, so in Sexy Brain, I explain in my theory how nature designed sex, not just for reproduction, but to keep the human brain going. And if we're having less sex and our bodies aren't able to have more sex or intimacy, it doesn't have to be the act of sex itself, it could be intimacy, we then don't have as healthy of a brain. That the other new understanding of intimacy is how brain protective it is. And I go into that uh, theory in my book. So I, I've written all of this out if you want it. <laughs> and I just want to say one other thing because it's important. I hate that so many women with breast cancer multiple millions are missing out on hormones. So I do have an ebook coming out next week um, that you can hand to your cancer doctor to explain the science that's available and together they can assess and see if that might be an answer for you to reduce your risk of recurrence and make your quality of life much better, even if you're on aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen. Well, Dr. Lindsay, you could see we could go on all day. There's so many amazing things to talk about, but to be respectful of your time, would you let our listeners know where they could learn more about you and get this amazing ebook that you're offering? So my website is Dr. Lindsay Berkson, D-R-L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-B-E-R-K-S-O-N, and you can sign up on my email list. And I'm giving a free webinar uh, in about two weeks called, Are You and Your Doctor Confused About Hormones? And at the end of that webinar, I'm going to give the book away for free. It's just a little ebook, about 30 pages. And then after that, I'm going to make it available on my website and as a Kindle um, on Amazon. And I just want it to be circulated around. It's funny, my editor has become like family. She's edited my last 10 or 11 books. I have 21 books out. And um, she got breast cancer a number of years ago. And she was editing this, this book on breast cancer survivors and hormone replacement. During that time, she had a follow-up visit with her cancer doc. So she printed out 
the ebook <laughs> went over to her cancer doctor. She said, I've been editing this book. And the cancer doctor started reading it and she couldn't stop reading it. And then she called my editor up a few days later and said they were so excited about the information in there that they were looking at utilizing this for their cancer patients. So this wow. is the peer review data put in a way that you're doc alike and you can also understand. So I'm hoping to move the information forward. Otherwise, I wouldn't be who I am today without hormone replacement. I would well, what a gift. So everybody take note. And we can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's been definitely delightful. And I've, I've learned so much. Thank you. And also, you know, I have a radio show, Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio, and I just love what you guys are doing here. How long have you been doing your show? Oh, this yeah. show, we've been about a year and a half. We were oh. live radio for a while, and now we just stopped doing live. We're doing podcasts, and I had a year before that, you know, so it's been a little while. I love what you're doing, and how did you all meet when you were training to become a health coach? How did that happen? I interviewed, I interviewed Andrea on my show. And then I interviewed Michelle also. And I said, I want to, I want more women. I think this could be like the view. This could be so much more fun. And I took me a while to convince them, but they finally came aboard. <laughs> Fantastic. May the hormonal force be with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Okay, ladies, so that was, that was a lot of hormones to take in, to receive on our receptors information. Uh, so what are your takeaways from today's hormonally challenged show? What do you got? Well, I am just thinking like, oh my God, I'm so glad I just bought these new mattresses. You know, we went and got the organic everything free mattresses and they cost about $11 billion, but you spend like half your life in bed, right? So that seemed really important. And I'm just thinking every time Dr. Berkson's like talking about cleaning out the receptors, I'm like, okay, where's my scrub brush? How do we do that? What else can I be doing? What are you guys doing? What do you got, Lisa? You know, I think for me, it just opens up so many more questions just about bioidentical hormones and their role in our lives, you know, my clients' lives, and just really understanding more about what they can offer us, you know, going forward. I, I too, had that kind of feeling of, oh, my God, they cause breast cancer, you know, and it was really nice to get clarification on that issue. So it, it's, if anything, it just opened up my curiosity even more about this whole world within our body. Yeah, I'm a big fan of hormones. I love them. <laughs> I love them. It's the communication system, as uh, she was explaining, Dr. Lindsay was explaining. And for those of you that do not uh, understand the web and email, <laughs> it's a communication <laughs> system. It's talking. You, you send a note, you receive a note. You send a note, you receive a note. And, um, and I love the connection between the male and the female hormones, you know, how it, they naturally balance each other and support each other, which it just seems natural, right? That they would naturally support and balance each other. So um, for me, I love uh, clearing the liver, <laughs> right? Because the liver is doing so much work in regards to hormones, as well as we didn't get to talk about exercise because that also... Uh, lets our hormones talk to each other in a specific way. And I love ancient medicine because according to the ancient medicine, our endocrine system is the same as our chakra system. And each of it is a, uh, it's the way that we receive information about our environment and how we react to our environment and ourselves within the environment and the entire universe. So it's an ancient system. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot to learn, especially in, in modern medicine, if they can take a step back and say, okay, how are we supposed to be communicating with each other, with ourselves, with the planet as a whole, like the really big picture. Uh, so, you know, grateful for Dr. Lindsay and her work in the world and for my co-hosts here. And for those of you that want to join us for live future shows, go to healthyviewshow.com to sub subscribe for updates. You'll be the first to know what's going on and when it's going to happen. And then to check out previous episodes, search for us on iTunes or YouTube. Look for The Healthy View. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today, coming out live, and, uh, and leave us a comment. We love hearing from you because uh, we want to communicate with you. 
<laughs> so we'll see you next time on The Healthy View. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.